Katie Lee CGC on Fertility Friday. Hi everyone, it's me, Katie Lee CGC. I am a multi-state licensed certified genetic counselor, and today I'm going to be reviewing a PGTA results report from iGenomics. Full disclosure, I did used to work for iGenomics. I don't currently, but I would trust them to do my PGTA testing if I was planning on that with my IVF cycle. If you're looking for a more basic video about what is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or pre-implantation genetic screening, the testing that you can utilize on embryo biopsies from IVF created embryos to test for chromosome errors, check out some of my other videos. I'll link them right up here. So check those out if you'd like a basic overview. But today what I'm gonna be doing is going over a results report. We're going to talk about it all. We're gonna talk about normal or euploid results, abnormal, aneuploid results, mosaic results. So get ready. One thing I do want you to keep in mind is that every lab is different. And even in the same lab, policies change over time. So if you have questions about your specific results, I strongly encourage you to talk to your own fertility doctor, your reproductive endocrinologist, and also to consider calling the lab. Most labs that do PGTA, they have their own set of genetic counselors who can answer questions specific to that laboratory. All right, so let's get into it. Here we have the iGenomics PGTA, or it's also called PGS, Pre-Implantation Genetic Screening Report. Um, you can see that the first kind of top third of the page is just going to be information about the patient, um, the sample, so when the trophectoderm or the embryo biopsies were received, when they were taken, and when the results report was released. And then you've got information about the clinic and the doctor. So you can see this is just a template or a sample report, so there's nothing really filled in. That's too exciting there. Um, next up is the most important part of the report. These are the test results. And then if we just take a quick scroll through the last three pages, this is all going to be limitations, um, you know, description of the task, descriptions of what's included, and that type of thing. With PGTA, you should get information about the number of chromosomes included in each embryo. The number of chromosomes is important because we know that embryos that are euploid or that have 46 chromosomes are going to have a much higher chance of implanting where embryos that are aneuploid with missing or extra chromosomes are going to have a much lower chance of implanting and resulting in a healthy live born baby. So the goal of PGTA is to identify euploid embryos that are going to have the best chance of resulting in an ongoing pregnancy. I want to quickly walk through each of the columns in this table so you know a little bit more about what you can expect back on a results report. So the first column is the embryo number. You can see that the that we're missing a lot of embryos here. That's typical because not every single embryo or egg that's fertilized is going to make it to the stage, the blastocyst stage, at day five or day six when it can be biopsied. So these are the six embryos that achieved blastocyst stage or grew all the way to day five or day six in the lab after the egg was fertilized by the sperm in the lab and that were biopsied and the biopsy was sent off to the lab to do this PGTA testing. So this is just the number. Of course, number is also important because that's how your clinic would match up these results with the appropriate embryo to prepare for a thaw and a transfer. Sample type, trophectoderm. You will see the same thing every single time on every single iGenomics results report because the biopsy or the little sample that's taken from each embryo it always comes from the part of the embryo that will form the placenta. And the technical name for that part is the trophectoderm. So trophectoderm biopsies are what the embryologist sampled from each embryo. Keep in mind they're removing usually about, you know, three to seven cells or so from this 100, 150 celled embryo. Morphology. Morphology is the quality or the grade of the embryo, how it looks under the microscope. You can always ask your clinic more if you have embryos and you're wondering about the grade. There's a few different grading systems used here in the US, but this is one of the most common ones. The embryo results, we'll hop back to this in a moment. Sex, because PGTA quantifies all of the chromosomes, that includes the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. Typically, individuals who have two Xs are considered biologically female and individuals with one X and one Y biologic males. That information can be included on the results report most of the time. There are certain laws and regulations in different countries, but in the U.S., if your doctor requests the sex of the embryo, it typically can be included. Day of biopsy. This is just when the embryo achieved blastocyst stage. 
And this is achieved at either day five or day six, most of the time, sometimes day seven. That's the day that the embryo made blastocyst stage and that embryo biopsy was removed by an embryologist. And then finally, we have mitoscore value and mitoscore ranking. Mitoscore value is a quantification of the amount of mitochondria in the embryo sampler in that trophectoderm biopsy. There's a hypothesis that an increased amount of mitochondria in the biopsy of euploid embryos may be associated with lower implantation rates. So actually, the higher the number, the worse. The lower the number, the better. So mitoscore ranking just takes into account only the mitoscore value. So it is simply ranking the embryos from the lowest mitoscore to the highest mitoscore, with the lowest being best. The euploid embryos with the best grade should always be prioritized. So you should use grade and chromosome results over mitoscore value. Of all of the different tools we have to rank embryos, mitoscore value is probably the least valuable tool. So one of the main times that it's actually used is when somebody has two embryos that are both chromosomally normal with the exact same grade, and then they're considering, you know, which embryo might have a better implantation rate. In fact, with these two embryos, 9 and 11, that are otherwise equal, their mitoscores are so similar here, it probably doesn't even make a difference anyways. Okay, now let's get into the PGTA results. Importantly, you can see that this patient or this couple have three euploid embryos. That means these embryos are chromosomally normal, embryos 7, 9, and 11, and they are going to be the best candidates for transfer. If I were this patient, I'd ask my doctor, which embryo do you recommend transferring first? And I certainly guess they would pick embryo number 7 because it had it is a day 5 4AA, which pretty much all clinics would consider better or having a better implantation rate than these day 6 3ABs down here. And you could ask your doctor questions like, what are the chances it implants? What are the chances it results in a healthy live-born baby? What are risks associated with the transfer? Should I transfer one or should I transfer two embryos? Those types of things. Because embryo 9 and 11 are also euploid or chromosomally normal, they're also good candidates for transfer. But because the grade is a little bit worse, they probably don't have quite as high of an implantation rate. Now let's talk about the abnormal results. It is completely normal to have some abnormal results in your PGTA results report. That does not mean that there's anything wrong with you or wrong with your partner. It is just simply a fact of human reproduction that a lot of our embryos are going to have chromosome errors. And the risk for chromosome errors increases with maternal age or age of the egg source at the time the eggs are retrieved. So the older the egg source is, the more likely you'll see a higher proportion of embryos with chromosome errors. Sometimes I see really young patients, patients in their 20s, where they have a batch of embryos that are all normal or euploid. And then when the egg source or the woman is in her 40s, I'd say especially as they approach, approach their mid-40s, there's a significant chance that all of the embryo results in a batch may be aneuploid or almost all may be aneuploid. Before I dive into these abnormal results, let me briefly explain what the aneuploid results will look like. They're going to have a plus or a minus sign. A plus means an extra copy of a specific chromosome, a minus, a missing. And then they'll always see the plus or minus sign followed by a number. And the number correlates with a specific chromosome. Our chromosomes don't have names, or I suppose they do have names. Their names are numbers. They're numbered 1 through 22 and X and Y. And we should have a pair of each of those chromosomes. So a pair of chromosome 1, a pair of 2, a pair of 3, and so forth all the way until we get to chromosome 22 and then the sex chromosomes. We might have two X's or one X and a Y, or we may have an extra or missing sex chromosome. So the aneuploid results coming from iGenomics will always show you what the specific chromosome error is. Now there usually isn't much to read into regarding those specific errors because they are almost always random. Um, it doesn't clue us into the fact that there's something going on with the egg source or sperm source. They are just these random errors that happen the vast majority of the time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the abnormal results. The sample from embryo number four is resulted as low mosaic aneuploid. A mosaic result is a result where both chromosomally normal cells and chromosomally abnormal cells were observed. And the specific type of abnormality that was observed in some of the cells from the sample was an extra copy of chromosome six or a trisomy six. So if you wanna learn more about a result, um, I always recommend that you request the results report from your doctor's office so you have a copy. Once you get your hands on that report, you can take a look at the interpretation section or the details section 
at iGenomics, a low mosaic result means that 30 to 50% of the cells in that embryo sample were abnormal with the extra copy of chromosome 6, and the remainder were normal. There is so much to unpack about mosaic results and what we know about mosaic results. We do know that sometimes mosaic embryos result in a healthy live-born baby, but we also know that they have a much lower chance of implanting and resulting in an ongoing pregnancy compared to normal embryos. So I would always, if this were my results, I'd always prioritize my euploid or my normal results over my mosaic. I am planning to do a video on mosaicism next week, so stay tuned for that. So for embryo number six, you can see the result is a little bit different. So ideally, an embryo would have two copies of each chromosome, including two copies of 19. If we saw a result that just read aneuploid plus 19 without the P, that would mean there were three copies of chromosome 19. But this one, it says plus 19P, so that means there's essentially two and a half copies of chromosome 19. This embryo has two copies of 19 plus a large additional piece, and that large additional piece is from the P arm. Most chromosomes have a P arm, that's the top half, and a Q arm, that's the bottom half. So there is a large extra piece of chromosome 19P. Finally, embryo number eight is called a complex aneuploid. All that this term complex aneuploid means is we're seeing more than one chromosome error. We're seeing two. So we're seeing that this embryo sample had both an extra copy of chromosome 7 and an extra copy of chromosome 15. So a trisomy 7 and a trisomy 15. Many times a patient will ask me how bad is it to be missing one chromosome or another. And it's important to note that most of the time having a missing or an extra chromosome, if that's present in every cell of the embryo, that would simply cause an embryo to not be viable. It would maybe cause the embryo to fail to implant into the patient's uterus if it were transferred, or it might result in an early first trimester loss. So having a whole extra or whole missing chromosome, if it's consistent throughout the embryo, that means that there's hundreds and hundreds of genes that are out of balance. It wouldn't just cause, you know, one small birth defect or something like that. We would expect an aneuploidy, a chromosome error, to cause a very early pregnancy loss, or for some chromosome imbalances, to cause a chromosome syndrome like Down syndrome, which is caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21. Now, if we scroll down, you'll see more information about each of the different types of results that can be observed. I'm not going to dive into any of this right now, but I would love to hear from you. Do you have any questions about PGTA results reports? What are you wondering about specific PGTA results? So that's it. Tell me down below in the comment section, what questions do you have about PGTA? I hope you found that results report helpful. Bye guys.